Hello, I'm Jan Lehman. And I am Muskan Joshi. Welcome to Med News Week Conference, where we feature presentations by Medicine's Global Leaders. Today, today we have an amazing keynote speaker in Dr. Amesh Adalja. Now, Dr. Adalja is the Senior Scholar at the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security. In today's presentation, Dr. Adalja discusses the history of pandemics and how they compare with the present COVID-19 pandemic. Did you know that Dr. Adalja is a quadruple board certified physician in internal medicine, emergency medicine, infectious disease, and critical care? He's also a member of the NCAA Coronary, or Coronavirus Advisory Group and has been a consultant to many businesses, schools, and organizations, along with serving on many U.S. government panels tasked with the development of guidelines for the treatment of the plague, botulism, and anthrax in mass casualty settings. What a phenomenal leader in the field of infectious disease and public health. So let's tune in and learn from this global leader. In this talk, what I'm going to try and do is kind of demystify COVID-19 and really put it in the context of other coronaviruses and why coronaviruses had such a, a penchant for pandemics, why we were worried about coronaviruses. And hopefully you'll get that through this lecture. Uh, my Twitter handle is there. If you're interested in following me, I talk a lot about infectious disease. So as I said, what I really want you to gain from this lecture is understand, an understanding of coronaviruses, pre-SARS and post-SARS. And SARS is the real touch point when it comes to coronaviruses. I want, you, I want you to be able to describe the members of the coronavirus family and understand what, what, what their role is. And then we're going to get into COVID-19 and, and some of the clinical management of coronavirus infections. So I want to really step back from COVID-19 and talk a lot about coronaviruses in general and their whole history, and then go into COVID-19. So just a, a quick slide to kind of show you the events of COVID-19. You remember um, in December 31st of, of 2019, China reported to the World Health Organization a cluster of cases of pneumonia with an unknown cause. Eventually, a novel coronavirus was discovered. It was found to be something that had efficient transmission from person to person, putatively linked to uh, an, animal, an animal wet market in Wuhan, um, and then basically spread throughout the world in a, in a pandemic fashion that we're still in the midst of now. But it's just important to kind of look, take a look at the, the first days of this, because when you have an efficiently spreading respiratory virus with an animal host, it is by defi <laughs> definition not going to be contained. It's going to be something that you that you are going to see spread throughout the world. And that's something that I think many leaders evaded in the early days of what this, this virus represented. So just to, to recap some of that, so mid to late December, there was a cluster of pneumonia cases without a diagnosis. The but if you look at the initial cases, the first case reported um, occurred on December 1st and had no contact with no contact with the market, telling you this was already spreading before it was actually recognized, which is not uncommon when you're talking about a respiratory virus that's mixed in with flu. And we, know, we now know that cases probably were occurring in November as well. There was a severity bias early on. Uh, we didn't really know what the case fatality ratio was. There was a wide spectrum of illness with mild illness and severe illness, as you've all probably dealt with. And eventually, a beta coronavirus uh, called SARS-CoV-2 was isolated, and it looks like it was stable in humans with a single introduction. And we've seen everything kind of go from there with all the clinical trials and antivirals and everything that we've, we've seen um, get developed over the last uh, two years. This is just a, a map to kind of a, a phylogeny to, tell you, to show you a little bit about the coronavirus family. <clears throat> what we're talking about here is a beta coronavirus. So that's on the left side of the screen in the kind of uh, pinkish area. That's where certain viruses like SARS-CoV-1, MERS, which we're going to talk about, are, are uh, th their house. The alpha coronaviruses include some of the other common cold-causing coronaviruses, although there are some common cold-causing coronaviruses in the beta coronavirus uh, part of this map as well. So as I said, even though the first case initially was December 1, China now reports the first case was likely November 17. That's the first case they have documented evidence for. But there is evidence, for example, of, of uh, coronaviruses circulating in France in late December in airport workers. Uh, there was some data on sewage in Italy that was positive for, for coronaviruses, uh, even in, before in the early days. And 
clearly, like I said, there was something going on in China in November, because what you see is a lot of quote unquote flu cases in Hubei province where Wuhan is that are testing negative for flu. And I think that really likely was COVID-19 that was spreading and unrecognized. And I think we do a very poor job of recognizing viral illnesses. And that's likely what was happening uh, before anybody realized what was going on until they saw that cluster at the seafood market. And that really prompted more epidemiological investigation. So as I said, Italy had sewage in, as early as December. Um, so clearly when you, when you talk about a respiratory virus that has a spectrum of illness that can't be distinguished from flu, and it transmits efficiently from person to person, it's going to be gone by the time you actually discover it in its point of origin. So by the time this was already recognized in China, it likely spread to many countries, not to the point where it was, where it was very apparent, but there clearly was seeding going on uh, at that time. So now I'm gonna take you all the way back to thinking about early days of virology and understanding of the common cold to help you kind of situate where coronaviruses fit. So when you think about the common cold, people knew for a long time that multiple viruses were responsible. Viruses that you've all heard of, like influenza viruses, adenovirus, rhinovirus, paraflu, RSV. But in some cases, about a third of them, they could not find any of those viruses. They could not find any bacteria. But they knew that if you took the mucus from one person, passed it through a filter that would get rid of bacteria, but not viruses, there was something infectious there but because you, could, you were inducing illness in a new person via secretion. So there was an unknown virus. And what happened was in 1960, there was a, a common cold in a boy that was investigated. They did the normal stuff, couldn't find anything, but they knew that this could transmit symptoms, the, the mucus. And what they were able to do is grow in human embryonic tracheal organ cultures, a virus, which they initially named B814. And you can see a picture of the electron micrograph in the top right hand part of the slide that has these protrusions. And it got the name Corona uh, from there. So this was the first human coronavirus in 1960 that was discovered. And there's the, and 1965 was the publication and there's the, the paper. Similarly, in 1967, they discovered another coronavirus called OC43. That first one that was called B814 eventually was renamed 229E. And that's one of the major coronaviruses. And OC43 was the second one discovered in 1967. And then they found these viruses in many different mammal species, uh, as well as in, in certain uh, poultry species like turkeys, for example, and chicken. So this was a virus that had, the, this is a viral family that can infect many different animals and had at least two family members that could infect humans, OC43 and 229E. And that was the coronavirus genus. And when it comes to corona, the coronavirinae family, there's two subfamilies, but I'm really just gonna focus on coronavirinae where we talked about the alpha, beta, and gamma. Alpha and beta are where the human coronaviruses reside. Beta tends to have the scary ones like SARS, MERS, and SARS-CoV-2. And coronaviruses have been known to cause viral upper respiratory infections since the 1960s and GI illnesses like diarrheal illnesses uh, for that, since that time. It is a single-stranded RNA virus, it's positive sense, um, and it has the largest viral GNA, uh, RNA genome, so it's very big in terms of the genes that it has. And this is sort of where coronaviruses sat until around 2003. There were two, they were considered common cold-causing viruses, they, people knew that they could cause severe disease in immunocompromised people, but not much else was thought about them. And these viruses were found worldwide. They tended to have a stark seasonality in winter and spring, just during respiratory viral season, like many other viruses. They caused about up to maybe 25 to 30% of common colds. And what we knew about these, and this is important when it comes to SARS-CoV-2, is that reinfection was common. And it was thought that antibody levels fell and people could get reinfected. So people would, most people would have had coronaviruses almost every year or every other year. That was the norm. Coronaviruses evolved to evade immunity to be able to cause mild reinfections. So keep that in mind when we think about SARS-CoV-2. It was much more common in children, uh, and not everybody became ill. A lot of people had very mild illness or asymptomatic illness, and there were super spreaders noted, which, we, which came to be very important during the first SARS outbreak in 2003. So people who disproportionately spread the virus uh, far and wide. And just a little bit on super spreaders. What it, what it means, so when you hear about an outbreak or you hear about an infectious disease, they often give you this number, R0. If you watch the movie Contagion, 
uh, Kate Winslet's character explains it on a chalkboard, on a, on a little whiteboard. R naught is how many people one person infects. So if you are, if an R naught of a virus is two, that means each person on average will infect two people. But R naught is an average. It's not what happens in real life. There are some people who infect no one, and there are some people who infect a lot of people. In fact, it's often thought that 20% of people are responsible for 80% of the infections, sort of this 20-80 or 80-20 rule. And this is not necessarily just seen with coronaviruses. This is seen with HIV. It's seen with typhoid. It's seen with tuberculosis. And clearly typhoid, everybody knows and has heard the story of typhoid Mary. She was clearly a super spreader. And in SARS, when you go to 2003, it's not a very contagious disease, except for those super spreading events. And the r naught is 2.7 without super spreaders. But with super spreaders, many of whom had runny noses, the r naught got very high. And that's really what was responsible for the outbreaks that occurred. Uh, for example, in Hong Kong that then seeded Canada uh, and the like. And just to refresh your memory about SARS in 2003, these are some editorial cartoons at that time. So you can see that there was concern now 18, 18 19 years ago that there was a, a, a lot of uh, obfuscation from the Chinese government, a, a lot of uh, lack of a major lack of transparency, uh, and, and that's nothing new. So just uh, to keep in mind that this was something that had already had occurred. So when people are suspicious of the, the information coming out of China, it's for good reason, because of what happened in 2003, where they basically hid those cases in military hospitals, not civilian hospitals. And it was only discovered when someone leaked it uh, on, a, on a discussion board for infectious disease doctors. So We've we've talked about two other um, we've talked about coronaviruses OC43 and 229E. After SARS, and I'm going to spend a little bit of time on SARS, people had started to look for other coronaviruses because they saw what SARS could do. So there was a kind of a scouring event trying to look for unknown coronaviruses, and in, in 2004 they found HKU1, which was a beta coronavirus that was in fact infected a 71 year old man with pneumonia, and then they actually looked back and at specimens during SARS a year earlier, and it was actually circulating at that time, and it could cause severe disease and death. So there were other coronaviruses out there that hadn't been discovered that were mixed in with all of our respiratory viruses. So coronaviruses in general, I told you, cause mostly common cold symptoms, GI symptoms, but they clearly have this ability to cause pneumonia and more severe disease in people who are immunosuppressed or elderly. And SARS was really what put coronaviruses on the map. And just at a top line level, SARS caused 8,000 cases, 800 deaths. So that case fatality ratio, or the mortality rate, is about 10%. And 25% of those people, 25 of people got ARDS. So this was the first coronavirus able to cause severe disease that really was in, in that was seen in the general population. And the thing about it was, it it wasn't that contagious outside of super spreader events that particularly happen in healthcare settings. So with SARS. As I said, there's about 8,000 cases, but infecting 29 countries, and it really showed what an what a infectious disease outbreak with a contagious respiratory virus could do. And I think it got people thinking about pandemic flu, about the, the role of other coronaviruses, very different than Ebola, which is scary, but not transmissible the way a respiratory virus is. SARS-CoV-1 uh, originates from bats, like all coronaviruses basically circulate in bats, but they had a spill, there's a spillover event to palm civet cats, uh, there's a picture of a palm civet cat on the on the slide there on a tree. Palm civet cats were a delicacy in certain restaurants, and people were getting infected by consuming palm civet cats. So the bats were infecting palm civet cats, and it was going to humans. There were other um, other animals too, like raccoon dogs. There's a picture of one there on, on the bottom of the slide. And once they could figure out that this was a zoonosis, that this was something that was coming from palm civet cats and wasn't spreading efficiently between humans. They basically put an end to it. And the only SARS cases we've seen since 2003 have been a couple of lab accidents that have, that, that have occurred um, in, in China and in Singapore and a, a few um, and a few in the wild. But it's not very common to see SARS-CoV-1. It's basically gone because people have changed the way they've handled the animal. That's why it's very important to find the origin of SARS-CoV-2 so we can understand if there is an intermediate animal, how should we change our interactions with that animal? There were eight cases of SARS in the United States. Most people don't realize that. Um, I just have a listing, a line listing of them all. A lot of them, uh, several of them, had. they're all travel related to places where there were COVID outbreaks, including Toronto. And interestingly, about the interesting things about these cases, and this, I think, attests to the fact that SARS-CoV-1 doesn't transmit that efficiently. 
there were 110 healthcare workers that were um, exposed or took care of those patients. And 45 healthcare workers had exposure without any mask use, but 0% uh, nosocomial infections, 0% uh, healthcare worker infections. Very, very different than SARS-CoV-1. So SARS put coronaviruses on the map as major pandemic pathogens. And then, you and then they found other coronaviruses like HKU1 and NL63 in the interim. But when Middle East respiratory syndrome arose, I think people really, they really started to worry about coronaviruses again. And to re so Middle East respiratory syndrome is also a zoonotic coronavirus. And I have a picture there of a, of a person kissing a camel and that's the, the intermediate host. It's bats to camels. And, and in parts of the Middle East, camels are almost like dogs are in the United States in terms of the affection owners show to them. And that was the route of transmission. So this story is also very interesting. So in June, 2012, there's a fatal respiratory illness in a, in a patient in Saudi Arabia. And there's an Egyptian doctor taking care of this patient in Saudi Arabia who then leaks the viral sequence. Again, very similar to SARS-1 where the host country does not want this to come out, leaks the, the virus, it gets, it gets sequenced in the Netherlands and they realize it's a novel coronavirus. And then there's also someone from Qatar that gets infected, gets treated in the UK and they also sequence the virus there. Then they look back at cases that were occurring in the Arabian Peninsula. And in 2012, in April, there were healthcare workers that were infected in Jordan um, that they were able to retrospectively diagnose. So this was something that had been spreading and unknown uh, for some time. And it spread to 26 countries, including the US. We've had two cases here and about 1,500 cases in around 500 deaths with a case fatality ratio of around 30, 35%. So much more severe um, than, than SARS-CoV-1 and much, much more severe than SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19. Again, this is a virus that doesn't transmit very efficiently from person to person. We have seen nosocomial super spreader events in hospitals like dialysis at dialysis centers, for example, but it's just not an efficient transmitter. So it's never materialized as a threat to the world. And this is a cartoon um, from the time of Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, uh, just kind of reminding you that coronaviruses were on the world's mind as major threats to the world. And this coronavirus there, it's in red there, it, it is a beta coronavirus. It's in the same vicinity as SARS-CoV-1, but clearly a, a, little, uh, a little bit different, but it is a beta coronavirus, which tends to be kind of the hotspot for worry when it comes to coronaviruses. <clears throat> they found related viruses circulating in bats. That's important to remember that bats are a major reservoir for coronaviruses. And it, it's, it, and it's something that they found antibodies to in camels. And that's how they've come up with this link of camels to, bats to camels to humans. That's, that's the ecology of MERS, uh, MERS cov two or cov one One of the other major events that happened with MERS was an outbreak that occurred several years later in South Korea, where a case was infected in the Middle East. The diagnosis wasn't, was, was a little bit hard to make and the person visited several hospitals. And because of that, infected multiple people everywhere. So this was a super spreader. And they had about three dozen deaths in South Korea and it really shook the South Koreans. And I think there was loss of confidence in the government. And I think that's really underlies, it underlies why South Korea early on with SARS-CoV-2 was just ahead of the pack in terms of testing, the ability to contact trace because they were so shaken by MERS that they really tried to make sure that this would never happen to them again. In the US, we had two cases, both healthcare workers um, that came back to the United States. They were mild cases, no secondary transmission. Um, and, uh, and also, you know, we, we, we did a lot of investigation for MERS cases and we often look for other viruses and sometimes we would stop looking um, once we got paraflu or something like that. But just to remind you that co-infections are really common with MERS. So even though there were only two official cases in 2014, I would not be surprised if there were more that just didn't get investigated because someone in isolated RSV or influenza A and then just stopped there. So some basic facts about COVID-19. This is usually a respiratory illness, although some patients can have GI symptoms. Fever, chills, throat, very common. And this must be all very familiar to everybody here. Loss of taste and smell, very specific for COVID-19, uh, especially in the, in the era of the original version of this virus and the alpha variant, maybe less common with Delta and Omicron. There is a 14 day incubation period, but people are usually sick by day seven. With Omicron and with, with Delta, that incubation period has shrunk. People get sick quicker. The severity has, is 
directly correlated with increasing age. In, and I think this is one of the, the um, striking features of COVID-19, how dangerous it is for the elderly and how, uh, and how less dangerous it is for younger people, which is very different than influenza, where the people that are at high risk for influenza are the very young and the very old. With COVID-19, it is the very old that are at the most risk and those with comorbid conditions. Although there are people can, that can get pediatric multi-system inflammatory syndrome, which is a Kawasaki-like syndrome that can occur in children. And there's also an adult version of it as well. PCR and antigen tests are, are the mainstay of treatment. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. We have antibody tests as well. Uh, CAT scans can, will often show ground glass opacity, which was a screening test that was used in places when there were no tests. And we've got a lot of medications now. I think arguably we've got some of the, the most uh, medications for any respiratory virus now. We've got, we started out with remdesivir, which is a polymerase inhibitor. We learned the use of, of corticosteroids. Uh, we learned how to do Im immune modulation. We also learned about coagulation abnormalities that occur in COVID-19. And we've also got this issue with long haulers that we're just beginning to scratch the surface of. So some of the critical care themes to think about here with COVID-19 was, you know, we knew that there was an unclear severity early on, but, and there were mild cases, but there were clearly severe cases occurring. We had real issues thinking about mechanical ventilation. First of all, there was a shortage of mechanical ventilators. Second, we didn't really know what the best strategy was because we know that mechanical ventilation causes barotrauma. And if you can avoid intubation, you should. But early on, people were reflexively intubating people that had any high oxygen need because they did not want to deal with the crash intubation. And eventually we learned that was harming people. And we got much more comfortable using BiPAP and CPAP and high flow nasal cannulas. Eventually also people were starting to use ECMO in younger people. And, and then we tried experimental antivirals, many of them, which have now some of them come to fruition. This is just a picture of, of one of my patients early on, just to show you how dramatic uh, the pneumonia can get from day one to day two. And I wanna just take a, a moment to step back to the last pandemic, which most of you have probably um, not really thought so much about, but 2009 H1N1, I was in training when this happened. And I think it was very important for a couple of reasons. It was rough working in ICUs at that time. And although people think that this was mild because the, the overall case fatality ratio was lower than for seasonal flu, the fact was um, 12,500 people died. There were 274,000 hospitalizations, 61 million cases, which is uh, a lot of cases. Um, 30, and and uh, we, we had a lot of issues getting Tamiflu to people who actually benefited because people just weren't using Tamiflu optimally. And if you look at 2009 H1N1, the average age of death in 2009 was 37 years of age. That's very different than seasonal flu, which the average age is like 72. So if you think about the millions of life years lost during 2009, it was significant because of who was dying. In 1918, the average age of death was around 27. So it was a severe pandemic in the sense of millions of life year lost, but because it didn't have that huge death toll overall in numerical numbers, I think it engendered a lot of complacency in people that they thought that this is what a pandemic looks like in the 21st century with modern critical care and modern infectious disease. And, and I did, they didn't really heed the warnings of this and things like replenishing the strategic national stockpile and N95 masks that just wasn't performed. So one of the other things I wanted to demystify a little bit is COVID-19 diagnostics. And I think the best way to think about them is to ask yourself the question, what, what are you trying to figure out with this test? What are you asking of the test? Are you asking, what is my patient sick with? Or are you asking, is my patient contagious? So that really comes to, is your patient symptomatic or asymptomatic? If they're asymptomatic, you're not asking what they're sick with because they're not sick. And I think that's the best way to think about ways to use antigen tests and PCR. If you're contagious, this is how I would, if you're sick, you can start with an antigen test. And if it's positive, you've got an answer. But if it's negative, you still haven't answered the question, what is my patient sick with? Is it COVID-19? Is it influenza? Is it strep throat? Is it some other respiratory virus? So that's where you have to not stop at the antigen test. You have to tell your patient, you need to isolate right now, and we're going to do further testing. And that testing could include a COVID PCR or an influenza test or a strep test. So it's important to think about where you use these tests because you hear a lot of 
misinformation, I think, about the way to use antigen tests. So just confusion over how antigen tests should be used. They're very good to pick up contagious people, and they're very good if they're positive. But if they're negative and your patient has symptoms, you cannot stop at that point. You, you need to think about what the patient is sick with. But it does correlate with contagiousness, though. That those, those antigen tests are valuable in, in the sense that we that if it's positive, that person is more likely to be contagious than not. Obviously, there may be some people that are positive that are not contagious because maybe the virus is defective at that point, but it can be used as a marker for contagiousness. A couple of clinical pearls to, to think about with COVID-19. Um, I had alluded to the fact that we were reflexively intubating patients early on some of these patients would come in and we called them happy hypoxics because they may have a pulse ox on room air in the 70s, but they're talking, they're texting, and it's a very eerie thing to see that uh, because they've sort of acclimatized to the hypoxia. And that was occurring because of si sort of a vasoplegia. Remember from physiology class that your lungs, the, the pulmonary vasculature undergoes uh, hypoxic vasoconstriction that can be impaired with COVID-19. So you are perfusing non-ventilated areas of the lung causing hypoxia. And because it happens in a way that allows the patient to acclimatize to it, they don't necessarily notice it. And what was happening were people were panicking and intubating those patients and that might have caused a lot more damage. They, they probably do better to be on CPAP, BiPAP or high flow nasal cannula. We also know that COVID is a vascular disease as well, that people become hypercoagulable. We became attuned to the, the risk of strokes or DVTs or pulmonary emboli in these patients as well. One of the things is that, um, about COVID-19 that differs from influenza is that co-infections tend to be rare. Uh, co-infections are very common with influenza. You always have to treat for staph aureus pneumonia in someone with influenza. But with COVID-19, the co-infections usually occur in the setting of prolonged ventilation in the intensive care unit. So ventilator-associated pneumonia may be common in COVID-19 patients, but co-infections as such are not, so, are not so common. So a couple of new treatments to, just, um, to talk through. Oxygen is the mainstay. And as I said earlier, uh, we're moving to high-flow nasal cannulas and BiPAP and CPAP in patients who don't necessarily require mechanical ventilation. Prone positioning, where you put people on their, on their belly, uh, the lung is sort of like a sponge and it will sort of reinflate somewhat um, if you can get the, the dependent portion, uh, if you change the dependent portion by putting people prone, even if they're not on a ventilator, if they're just on nasal cannula, having them self-prone in the bed can improve their oxygenation. And for refractory cases, ECMO has been used uh, successfully. Dexamethasone, the corticosteroid, was something that we immediately jumped upon when we saw data showing that it improves mortality, but it improves mortality in those who need oxygen. So this is an anti-inflammatory agent that works at the inflammatory stage of the, of, the, um, of the viral illness. So this is something that is usually marked by needing oxygen, because needing oxygen means there's, there's been lung damage, and that dexamethasone can dampen, that, dampen the immune response and improve oxygenation. Remdesivir was the first antiviral available. It was something that was shown to decrease recovery time. People get out of the hospital quicker. There's a lot of controversy whether or not remdesivir actually improves mortality. Uh, I suspect it probably does not in, in patients, but it does get people out of the hospital quicker. There is new data, however, with using remdesivir as a three-day infusion to prevent people from going into the hospital. And now that hospitals have some breathing room, they're able to offer this treatment where someone comes into the infusion center three days in a row and gets infusions of remdesivir and it prevents hospitalization. In the last several months, we've had two breakthrough treatments that, that are able to uh, keep people out of the hospital with just oral pills, and that's Paxlovid and Molnupiravir. They both have two different mechanisms of actions. Paxlovid is a protease inhibitor, um, and it's something that has really uh, excellent data, 90% decrease in hospitalization uh, when you get Paxlovid to people within five days. This is something that <clears throat> does take some finesse with prescribing because it is a, a cytochrome P450 drug, so you have to look at drug-drug interactions. Molnupiravir doesn't have cytochrome P450 drugs, but it's not as potent a drug as Paxlovid. Uh, it's something that may be 30% decrease in hospitalization. Uh, one of the things about it is a mutagen, so you have to be careful in, in using this in pregnant women. Again, these have a, a window of that maximal benefit of five days, so it's really important that you link patients to this very quickly when they call you with a home test, for example. 
We also use immune modulation um, in severe cases, people who have that kind of cytokine storm, drugs like baricitinib and tocilizumab that all work in the IL-6 pathway. There are others as well. It, this all depends upon what your hospital has in stock, but they do decrease mortality in those severe patients. One of the, the pitfalls is people waiting too long though to give them. So you should give these as soon as you see a patient with escalating oxygen needs, this is where you should be using this drug. Prevention, um, we, we have a couple of things to, um, to talk about with prevention, um, monoclonal antibodies are very, very interesting and they were able to be developed very quickly. However, they've sort of been constrained by the development of variants that certain variants like the beta variant, the gamma variant, and certainly Omicron have limited their usefulness. So you can use monoclonal antibodies in several, several roles. One is for treatment. So someone who is infected with COVID-19, they're within seven days or so of, of symptoms and they have risk factors for severe disease can benefit by monoclonal antibody infusion to prevent them from coming into the hospital. And there was actually some data for people who get hospitalized who don't make their own antibodies that a monoclonal antibody might be useful as well. So that's some emerging data hasn't quite all been vetted yet, but that's something you may see monoclonal antibodies be used. You can also use monoclonal antibodies as post-exposure prophylaxis. So if somebody gets exposed to COVID, you can give them a monoclonal antibody and it prevents infection. And recently we have a monoclonal antibody useful for pre-exposure prophylaxis. It's called Evashield. Uh, Evashield is um, used in immunosuppressed populations. It's a long acting monoclonal antibody, um, especially useful in people with solid organ transplants, bone marrow transplants, people with B cell depleting therapy. That's something you should try and link your patients to. As I said, the monoclonal antibodies have really been constrained now by the Omicron variant. So we really have only two that work, citrovimab and beb bebtelovimab. Uh, bebtelovimab was just uh, granted emergency use authorization. So the older monoclonal antibodies that we were using, the Lily cocktail, the Regeneron cocktail, those are no longer recommended because Omicron is the major variant in the United States and the others don't have neutralization activity against them. Obviously we have the vaccines, that's the mainstay of prevention. It's always better to prevent illness uh, than to, to actually have to go through treatment. And we have three that are um, available in the United States, both Moderna and Pfizer are now FDA approved, uh, Pfizer 16 and above, uh, Moderna 18 and above, uh, and the other age groups are available on emergency use authorization. I'm not gonna go into much detail on the vaccines because that's a whole other lecture, but suffice it to say, it's really, important to emphasize that the vaccines are excellent at preventing, again, preventing what matters, preventing serious disease, hospitalization, and death. And it's remarkable that these vaccines that are directed against the ancestral strain of this virus are still able to stave off severe illness from the Delta variant, from the Omicron variant. So I think these are, are you know, some of the most path-breaking vaccines. There are second generation vaccines that are in development. We'll see, maybe there'll be a universal coronavirus vaccine in the, way, in, in the future, but they are still the mainstay of taming this virus. A little bit about the variant, I just listed all of these variants. Expect to see more variants. Um, that's what this virus does. So recall earlier what I said about the, the community uh, coronaviruses, the ones that cause common colds, they always evolve to get around our immunity. So we can expect to see variants continue to evolve. I think it's gonna be more, the most likely scenario is that this coronavirus evolves to be like the fifth seasonal coronavirus. And it's gonna be important to have situational awareness of these variants, to understand what they do, how well our monoclonal antibodies and vaccines work against them. But I think it's gonna be very hard for a variant to erase all the protection that a vaccine provides. Meaning yes, you might get more common breakthrough infections like Omicron, but the vaccines are gonna hold because of their T, the T cells that they generate against those severe outcomes. And I think that's, that's excellent when it comes to what we're trying to achieve with COVID-19. There's still a lot of questions that we don't quite understand. Um, we know that pre-symptomatic transmission occurs, people are contagious before they have symptoms, but are people who never get symptoms, how contagious are they? We still don't know that question. We still have a lot of misunderstandings or not quite a full picture of the role of children, the role of children in spreading the virus, the viral loads that they have, how contagious they are, uh, what explains MISC in certain children. Convalescent plasma using the blood of recovered individuals. Uh, we still are trying to figure out a role for this. There's new data that shows high titer convalescent plasma might be useful, uh, but we've got other options. So it's kind of something you put on the back burner unless you have no other options. Transmission greater than six feet, we know what occurs, how often it occurs. Um, that's something to, to really think about. We know that this doesn't have the epidemiology of measles, for example, which is the classic airborne disease. 
but it, it's something that there's a spectrum of transmission between droplet to, to uh, airborne that I think needs to be further elucidated. And I think we still need to work out our testing strategies. We're going to continue to test for COVID-19, especially with antivirals. But I think it's still there's still a lot of work to figure out what the optimal way to test for this is, when to test for it, who should be testing, that type of thing. One of the questions I often ask is, what happened in the United States? Why do we have a million deaths? Why did we have all of these shutdowns? Why did we do so badly when the US was considered the most prepared nation for a pandemic? And I think it comes to the fact that, yes, the US has a really great toolbox for pandemic preparedness, but if you don't use those tools or you use them improperly, it's not gonna matter. And we have decades upon decades of neglect of public health. Public health agencies are never prioritized by government. They never have the ability to hire enough people. They can't contact trace. And that happened throughout this pandemic. It was, and even though it was a recognized shortcoming that for example, in the summer of 2020, no health department took the time to actually hire enough contact tracers to even keep up with COVID-19 cases. When they, when they shifted from testing to vaccination, they closed the testing clinics because they didn't have enough testing. They didn't have enough people to run the vaccine clinics. So this is something that really, uh, I think, hampered our ability to respond. Well, there was a lot of evasion of what this virus meant. As I said, an efficiently spreading respiratory virus with an animal host cannot be eradicated, cannot be eliminated. Can, Containment is not possible. You had to get people ready early. And in the United States, we gave the virus a two and a half month head start. And we had such botched testing where you could not test and who you could test was so limited. People from China, even though we knew this was spreading outside of China and people with lower respiratory tract symptoms only, not people who had a sore throat, for example, who were just who were, who were contagious and could go about their life. That, that led to un, undiagnosed chains of transmission that bubbled over in hospitals in New York City. And I think what we, we should look at is a country like Taiwan, where they were not reactive to COVID, they were proactive. Just on rumors in December of 2019, they sent a team to China to investigate. They put themselves on a stance where they were able to meet cases where they came. And for much of the pandemic, they did so much better than everybody else. And they did not have to result, they did not have to resort to blunt tools that treated every activity as if it was a COVID risk. They, they really avoided most of those. Uh, those, those lockdowns, which have negative cascading impacts on all of society because they were proactive. And I think that's, that's who you should look at um, for how to handle this much better than, than the United States did. So what is it about coronaviruses? Why are they such a pandemic threat? As I said, they can infect many different mammalian hosts as well as, as, well as avian hosts. So they've got many potential avenues to infect humans. They can recombine. All of these, these, uh, these viruses can recombine in different hosts and they can generate something new. They're all over the world. They're not restricted geographically. They're spread through the respiratory route. That's very difficult for anybody to intervene upon. And bats are their kind of reservoir. And there are many bats, over a thousand species, and they're worldwide. And they have many different viruses and very dense populations. So rats, bats, uh, sorry, bats of different species roost together, allowing more, I, opportunity for viral exchange. So I think all of these characteristics make coronaviruses something that are going to continue to be a pandemic threat. Interestingly, um, you know, we talk about COVID-19 as the only coronavirus pandemic we know about, but there is some circumstantial evidence, some hypotheses about the Russian flu that occurred in the late 1800s, where there were some anecdotal reports that this was a disease that led to loss of taste and smell. The elderly seemed to be at higher risk, children were spared which is very different than flu. Um, this is controversial. Some people, I don't know the answer to this, but there have been some that are speculating because OC43, the second coronavirus discovered, it looks like it diverged from bovine coronavirus or coronavirus of cows around the time of this pandemic. There is some circumstantial evidence that it might be the case, although there are other people who say this certainly was a type of influenza. So this is just a debate, but it's something that you might hear about or, or read about in the news. So what are my predictions with COVID-19? I think that this is going to become the fifth seasonal coronavirus. I think it's going to follow the path of those other four coronaviruses and become something that we deal with year in and year out. And it's going to lose its ability to cause severe disease, not because the virus changes, but because we change, because we get immunity from vaccines, from prior infections, that we have tools like antivirals and monoclonal antibodies. And we learn so much about the disease, about the risk factors for severe disease, about the complications that we're able to tame it. I think the next couple of seasons, it will still have an outsized influence, 
but it's increasingly going to be decoupled from hospitalizations. It's increasingly going to be like more of the other coronaviruses. That's my hope. And I think that with more tools, that's the way it will go. So what do we do now? I think what's important as we move into this endemic phase of COVID-19 is still focus a lot on healthcare preparation, making sure that hospitals are able to deal with surges of patients. There is always going to be a baseline number of cases, hospitalizations, and deaths from COVID-19. And there may be hotspots that flare. When that happens, if it gets particularly dangerous for a hospital to operate, I think we need to be able to move people there, move resources, federal state resources, to be able to augment staffing as we've got this massive staffing problem all over the country. We also have to inculcate in people that this is not a virus that's going to go away. That this is gonna be with us. So long as there's humans on the earth, there's going to be COVID-19. And we have to teach people the principles of harm reduction, that if there are people that have very low risk tolerances, and there are many out there right now that are having difficulty coping with COVID-19, we have to teach them, this is how you can reduce harm. You can, you can continue to wear a mask if you want to. You can do this outdoors. You can use rapid tests. You can be vaccinated. You can get antivirals. And people have to learn how to risk calculate. And much of that was stunted because for much of the pandemic, the official US policy was abstinence only. And that stunted the ability of people to know what was safe, what wasn't safe. And it really created this false alternative where some people acted as if the pandemic wasn't going on and other people were very, very scared of the pandemic when we really needed to get people in the mind of risk calculation and harm reduction. I think we'll likely see more, anti, more medical countermeasures, antivirals, monoclonals that will develop over time, more and better home tests. I'd like to see home tests expand to not just SARS-CoV-2 or not COVID, not just COVID, but flu and RSV and group A strep. Uh, I think that would be a really a great, uh, a great piece of technology to have in everyone's house so that they could test themselves for multiple viruses. Uh, pediatric vaccines are still coming. There's a lot of controversy over them. We saw data today that the lower dose doesn't seem to work so well, even in the 5 to 11 group, and it doesn't, and there's clearly issues with it in the 2 to 4 age group. And then there are also second generation vaccines that are developing, including universal coronavirus vaccines. So it's unclear exactly what the trajectory is going to be and what the optimal vaccine policy will be, but it's something that will evolve over time. So that was kind of a whirlwind tour of COVID-19, hopefully putting a lot of it in context uh, for you, uh, understanding some of the history of coronaviruses and why they're such a, a pandemic threat or why they became a pandemic threat.